Hi, it's Mr. Duffy. Today we're going to talk about measurements. If we were in class, you would be doing a lab accompanying this, but um, since we're not, we're going to just have to go through and talk about how we make good, accurate measurements in length, mass, and volume. So let's go ahead and get started. In chemistry class, we use a lot of uh, measurements, and being able to take good, accurate measurements is very important. What we need to know how to do is use a measuring tool to its limits. Basically, again, we're measure it as accurately as possible. When we're talking about length, we're measuring, um, you know, normally in centimeters or meters, but uh, a typical ruler has centimeter markings and then millimeter subgraduates. So what we can use is we can use the centimeter marks and then the millimeters to, um, again, measure an object. Here I have three different objects that are marked in, in with red lines. And if we wanted to measure them, what we need to do is measure what we know and then estimate a final place. So for the first marking here, I would say that that is 1.1 centimeters. But since it's kind of falling between the 1.1 and then the 1.2, I'm allowed to estimate that last spot and say maybe it's 1.18 centimeters. And that's kind of important. We want to try and use a device to its limits. I definitely know it's 1.1 and I definitely know it's not 1.2. So it's kind of just somewhere in between there. And that last spot is estimated and that's fine. Just try and estimate it the best you can, but you should always include that. For the second mark, I would say again, that is four centimeters definitely. And then 4.2 is, I think it's falling directly on the line. So since it's falling directly on the line, I'm allowed to estimate that final spot, but I should say it's 4.20 um, to get two decimal places on this ruler. Basically what I'm saying is you should be able to get two decimal places on a ruler uh, that has millimeter markings. Um, somebody else might say it's like 4.19 centimeters, something like that, okay? On the final marking, I would say that somewhere 7.48 centimeters. So just keep in mind that we're supposed to estimate that final place. So that was length. Now let's talk about volume. We measure volume with um, several different devices, but most typically we're going to use a graduated cylinder. Graduated cylinders look like this over here, and we have a variety of different sizes. But other things can be used to measure volume as well, such as a test tube, but test tubes really don't have any graduation marks. So it's kind of just, you're, you're kind of guessing what the volume is. Beakers, on the other hand, hold lots of, um, they're varying sizes, but they normally hold a good amount of liquid. Um, so again, they don't have quite as many graduations, but a graduated cylinder is very good. It has nice markings and uh, allows us to take good, accurate volume measurements. So moving from least accurate to most accurate here. And if we really wanted to measure a good uh, accurate volumes, we'd use a graduated cylinder. And there are devices that are actually more accurate than a graduated cylinder. Now, these are for liquids, which is again, what we normally would be measuring in chemistry, but you can also measure volumes of regular solids like a cube, length times width times height or a cylinder. These you should remember again from uh, your math classes, like geometry and so forth, how to find the volumes of regularly shaped objects. Really, all we're going to use in chemistry, if we did need to measure a regularly shaped object, it'd be length times width times height. Okay, a cube. So let's talk a little bit more detail about how to measure volume. Uh, to read a graduated cylinder, we need to read a specific part of the graduated cylinder called the meniscus, a specific part of the liquid. Um, what we need to do also is make sure when we're reading the meniscus, so the close-up view, the bottom part of the curve, we need to make sure we're at eye level with the meniscus. Now, that gives us good, accurate um, measurements when we're actually measuring a graduated cylinder. And here's why. If you're not reading from eye level, if you're reading above or below eye level, you're going to get the wrong volume reading because of where your, <clears throat> your eye crosses and, and sees the the markings on the graduated cylinder. So if you're looking at a too high vantage point, if your eye is above uh, the menisc meniscus level, you're gonna get a volume level that's too low. What you see on the graduated cylinder is a lower marking than it should be. And if you're below the meniscus level, 
then you're going to read a volume that's too high. And so it's very important to be, when you're measuring volume correctly, to read the meniscus at eye level. Now, we can also use a graduated cylinder to measure the volumes of other objects that are maybe irregularly shaped. Let's say we've got a, a rock here that we want to measure the volume of. Now, we can't just do length times width times height because, again, it's a weird shaped object. What we have to do is we have to do what's called the water displacement method. And the water displacement method allows us to measure the water level before and the water level after, and then the difference is the volume. So here in the first one, I would say the volume is 200 milliliters, and here it's about 280, uh, 260 milliliters. So the difference there would be 60 milliliters, and so that would be the volume of the rock. So again, water displacement level lets me figure that stuff out. Now, the one that's easiest to measure is mass, the mass of an object. The, to measure the mass of an object, we basically can just put it on a scale. Um, the scale has an on off button, we turn that on, we wait for it. It normally takes a little while to calibrate. Once it gives us a zero measurement, um, we place the object on top of it, wait for the mass to actually uh, stop moving, and then we record that value. You do not have to worry about estimating a place on a scale because the scale actually automatically just estimates it for you, that last spot, it rounds it um, in the computer before telling you what shows up on the screen. Okay, now another um, good way that a scale, again, uh, is very useful is it has a zero button. And so a zero or a tear button on the side allows us to place a container on the scale zero or tear out that container and then place an object in the container and get the mass. This is great for a liquid or some object like maybe a chemical that you don't want to put directly onto the scale pan itself. Um, so if you're measuring a liquid, you might put a beaker onto the scale, zero or tear the beaker, pour the liquid in, and then you have the mass of just the liquid. Otherwise, what you'd have to do is subtract, which is also possible. So you can measure the beaker before, measure the beaker and the liquid afterwards, and then subtract the two. But the scale just automatically does you does that for you with the tear button. So you wouldn't even have to worry about it. So this is how to make good, accurate measurements using estimated places on volume and length. Um, the scale does estimated places automatically for you. But this is how to make good, accurate measurements in chemistry.